Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to day two of Together on Sound 2020, uh, Canada's national conference devoted uh, to tracking progress on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, if you on the Twitter chat uh, this morning with Future of Good, uh, you got a head start of us. I uh, hope that was a good time. And my name is Yvonne Tuko. I'm your MC. Uh, as you may know, I'm your MC for uh, Together on Sound. And before I keep going, I just want to mention that again, uh, I'll probably be uh, switching sometimes between French and English, so feel free to uh, be on one channel on the inter interpretation, interpretation button below. And yeah, um, I'm talking to you from Edmonton, Alberta, right from the Alberta Council for Global Corporation Office. Uh, Edmonton is situated on Treaty 6 uh, territory, um, which is the traditional lands uh, for First Nations and Métis people. Uh, le Crété 6 est, est, est le territoire traditionnel euh, pour les personnes, euh, les, pers les premières nations pour se réunir et inclut euh, les nations telles que Cri les Cris, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, euh, Ojibwe, Soto, Anashinaabe, Dene et, et beaucoup d'autres euh, nations qui continuent à enrichir euh, nos, com euh, nos, nos communautés, nos langages euh, vibrantes. Together Ensemble eh, is also hosted through a partnership uh, between Waterloo Global Sense Initiative and the Sustainable uh, Development Solution Network uh, and the University of Laval. It's also funded in part by the uh, Government of Canada Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals Funding Program with additional support from the Alberta Global Council for, uh, of, for Global Cooperation, Alliance 2030, uh, Perimeter Institute for Theo Theoretical Physics, and the University of Waterloo. The event organizing team is running everything all the way from Waterloo, Ontario, which is situated on the Hardiman track, uh, land that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River and is within the territory also of the neutral Anishinaabe uh, people and the Haudenosaunee uh, people as well. Yesterday, uh, as we got started, we shared this slide uh, about Native, Native Dash Land, a project that helps Canadians learn more about Indigenous people around the, the world. Here it is again. Uh, be sure to check it out. It's a good resource to just kind of like learn uh, where, where you're situated, where your feet are rested, where your feet are planted. Yesterday's sessions left us with a lot to think about overnight, and this morning's Twitter chat focused on Canada's global responsibilities. As we get started today, uh, we want to remind you to think about our collective uh, stewardship role and to consider again what we can do together over the coming decade to support Indigenous people in the quest for a brighter future, uh, what our responsibilities to the land and to each other in the future. Today is going to be a really, really busy day. Uh, there are going to be six sessions during uh, each of the breakout programming blocks. Uh, if there's any way that we can help you have a positive experience and a positive and engaging experience throughout the day, please reach out to the live chat or feel free to contact the uh, event organizer team at info.togetherensemble.com. Uh, my, mon rôle avec uh, durant toute la conférence, uh, toutes ces conférences virtuelles, c'est vraiment de vous guider et uh, de, de uh, donner un peu des, uh, de faire un peu du, du ménage et de s'assurer que tout le monde respecte justement les règles, les dialogues uh, qui ont été établis par l'équipe uh, de Together Ensemble et par, et par la conférence. Uh, Okay, so first off, uh, we may face some interesting challenge keeping everyone connected today. So it's not un uncommon, if you were here yesterday, uh, it's not uncommon to have unstable Wi-Fi, whether it's that's for you or that's for some of our panelists or our moderators. Uh, and so we can predict what's going to happen when we, con when we convene people across six time zones. Uh, so we ask that you be patient with us. We'll try to solve all these problems as, as fast as possible. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a couple of housekeeping items uh, with our Zoom conference. Uh, so currently you're on mute. Uh, for today's plenary and breakouts, uh, you'll also be on, on mute, but you have access to the uh, Q&A and the live chat below. Uh, so we ask, that you use, uh, we, we ask that you use those tools to communicate with us. 
organizers uh, can be identified by the word organizers uh, right in front of the Zoom uh, Zoom name. Uh, we, we ask that you also use your real name and not a nickname for the Zoom chats. Uh, we've all used Zoom over these past months to chat with friends or anything of the sort. So make sure it's your real name. Uh, that will just help us out and the panelists a lot. Um, together has a code of conduct, uh, which we've just linked to uh, in the chat. Uh, so if your experiences, if, if you're experiencing an issue or notice that someone else is being harassed or have any other concern at all, please contact a member of the Together on some organizing team immediately. Again, organizers can be reached uh, via email at info point together at gmail uh, together ensemble at gmail.com uh, please make sure that the subject line is urgent code of conduct so we can get back to those emails as soon as possible we really really um really really want to put an emphasis on uh, safety and uh, inclusivity throughout the conference uh, si vous êtes victime de har harcèlement, remarquez que quelqu'un d'autre euh, est harcelé ou avait, avait d'autres problèmes ou préoccupations, euh, veuillez contacter l'équipe euh, de Together Ensemble euh, à, à partir de faux points Together Ensemble à, 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 à gmail.com. Les organisateurs peuvent être également contactés à travers le chat, le live chat. Et euh, quand vous les contactez par email, assurez-vous euh, de mettre urgent code de conduite euh, pour que l'on puisse vraiment euh, retourner et répondre à ces emails le plus vite possible. Uh, there's an alternate audio track uh, where you can access an interpret version of the main language in each session. So most of the content will be available in French and English. So if uh, you, some uh, panelists might be bilingual and might be switching between French and English. So feel free to stick to one channel so you can just follow through uh, with that language for the whole session or you know go go at it you know flex your bilingualism and uh, try to uh, do it both in, in both in english and french uh there are reporters in each session uh the job is to document insights and reflect them back to you in the plenary sessions uh, the notes will be compiled after the uh, after the event and released as a report as well you may have met jacob berkowitz yesterday and his reporter his amazing reporter team yesterday uh stick around for plenary and you'll be caught up on what everyone else was doing in the in alternate sessions uh, we've also made a few t a, a few uh, a few changes to make things easier uh, today uh, we are extending our programming blocks from 45 minutes to one hour so you have a full 15 minutes q a session with the presenters if you were here yesterday you noticed that we had some issues with the coffee chat so we just want to make sure that it's being troubleshot um, we are simplifying our coffee chats. Uh, there's only going to be one coffee chat in each block. So now if you join that, if you join that chat, you'll be able to talk to anyone in that room with no breakouts. Uh, the coffee connections are not recorded, but they are moderated. Uh, they will happen at 12.45 p.m. and 2.45 p.m. Uh, Eastern daytime, uh, daylight time. Uh, coffee chats are overlapped with the last 15 minutes of Q&A of the previous programming blog. So just keep that be, just keep that in mind. Uh, again, those coffee chats are going to uh, going to be a great way to just kind of like connect with everyone that is uh, attending the conference. And yeah, uh, you have, uh, as you know, you have a lot of choice of programming today. Uh, again, don't worry about missing out. You'll be able to catch up on all of these things, uh, whether that's through uh, Jacob Berkowitz and his team of reporter or through uh, the daily digest that will be coming at the end of uh, every day. Uh, and so we'll try to put these uh, quickly as well. Uh, we'll try to post all the uh, sessions on YouTube as well. They are recorded, so they will also be available on the Together on Psalms YouTube channel. Our goal is to make uh, the programming easy for you uh, to access. So all the links are in the schedule. You can move from room to room during each uh, programming block. Uh, I've done that before and you know, the first time I tried to do that, I noticed that it was like, you're going to get, uh, you're going to exit this room. So don't be scared by that message. You have indeed to exit one room to be able to like get into another one. Uh, and again, we asked everyone that you please don't share the link with everyone. Uh, anyone that has registered to the conference has access to the same link through Eventbrite and through the schedule as well. 
um, if something goes wrong during one of the sessions, uh, the presenter's connection drops out or the connection is really bad, we'll try to arrange a follow-up recording and make the session available as soon as uh, right after the event. If we can solve the problem quickly, uh, run on the spot, we direct you to another session. And uh, most problems can be solved by leaving the Zoom session and coming back in. Uh, there's always this room for everyone. We really want to stress us out. So uh, don't worry about taking our space. As I say. Uh, the spirit of Together on Some is one of cooperation and mutual respect. Uh, the commitment to leave no one behind uh, has been described by UN Deputy Secretary General Jan Heliasso as the underlying moral code for, the, uh, for Agenda 2030. Uh, so we're striving uh, to make that this model a foundational part of this event. And so we know that our approach is not perfect, that there's always going to be room, room for improve, improvement. So do not hesitate to reach out uh, with suggestions or guidance or anything that you notice that you think can be uh, made better over the uh, future years uh, when we can hopefully actually all meet together again in person. Maybe we'll have another virtual conference as well. That, I think that'll be really fun. Uh, so as you engage, uh, last but not least, as you engage in uh, conversations, please remember that we all come from uh, different regions of Canada. Uh, we have uh, different religions, different any backgrounds, and speak uh, different uh, languages as our mother tongue. Sometimes uh, misunderstanding just really happens because of uh, of another point of, of the mi misunderstanding between people happen because of the misunderstanding or another points of view. Uh, so I always ask for clarification first. Um, it's always important. Uh, we always ask to people to be tough on issues uh, and but be soft on people. Again, uh, I think I said this over and over yesterday, uh, we are all in quarantine, we are all in isolation. Uh, it's, it's, already, uh, it's already really hard as is. So make sure you're kind to each other. We don't know, we don't, some of us don't know each other. Some of us uh, live across different time zones. So, you know, it's important to be here, make friends, make connections that hopefully you can actually foster after the conference, after this pandemic is over. So uh, what do we want to achieve together today? Uh, we hope you'll make an interesting uh, connection and consider a commitment that can help us help us towards uh, move to move the ball towards Ad Agenda 2030. Uh, we also hope that you will share with us uh, what is working in your sector, in your community, and across your region. Uh, we want to learn from each other and find different ways to connect our work. Uh, want, one way to start connect, uh, connected after Together on some is to make sure you join Alliance 2030 uh, platform, or if you're in Quebec, uh, the Consortium, the Consortium Accelere uh, 2000 Campus Quebec. Those are really good platform again to just get connected, uh, uh, stay connected with um, with what's being done in the SDGs in your region and in your communities. Uh, and of of course, uh, please do not forget to hashtag uh, together. 20, uh, together on some 2020 on your social feeds, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Periscope. If you're on there, tweet anyway. Uh, you're really uh, catching up about this. Uh, please hashtag. It will make it a lot easier for us to find those posts and be able to like repost them or use them as feedback, reviews, or testimonials uh, in the future. Um, we are ready uh, to hear from uh, young people from across uh, the country on their vision for 2020. So quickly, I'm going to uh, let the vid video, really, really cool video play, and then we'll have the opportunity to hear from uh, amazing young folks that are doing uh, great things in the community. Thank you, and have an amazing conference today. In 2015, World governments created 17 sustainable development goals that we can use to build a sustainable future by 2030. We have 10 years left to achieve these goals. That's 10 short years to completely change the way we live, lead our countries, and interact with nature. Change may have come more suddenly than we'd expected with the start of the coronavirus pandemic, but it's this very pandemic that made us realize how urgently change needs to happen. It is youth that will lead the world's recovery post-pandemic. They have the opportunity now to inform how we can build back better. So we asked them, what kind of world do they want to live in by 2030?
By 2030, I want to live in a world where we see major progress on preventing climate change. Where we see responsible, low-carbon policies and investments that support resilient and sustainable global systems. I want to live in a world where we are resilient in the face of natural disasters and other emergencies. Où chacun peut se déplacer de façon simple et sécuritaire dans une ville durable et belle. I want to live in a world where the planet and people are seen as equal. Where quality education prepares youth to create livelihoods for themselves and their neighbors, and inspires them to be active and global citizens. Where inclusive work is made accessible to all. Where les gens de différentes communautés peuvent vivre en dignité et en toute sécurité. If we want to see our vision become a reality, we need to make sure that education for sustainable development is incorporated in every learning stream across every discipline. We need to integrate the principles of sustainability and the SDGs in every strategic plan from governments, industries, societies across the world. We need to change our policies to hold workplaces accountable. We need to further invest in local, and global sustainable development using scientific, technological, and financial resources. We must create more spaces and opportunities for diverse women to participate and take leadership. We need to come up with solutions that serve our entire communities. And help to protect vulnerable populations. Our collective response to the coronavirus crisis teaches us that it is possible to mobilize huge numbers of people to work together towards a common goal. Mais surtout, Elle nous a appris que ensemble, nous pouvons surmonter des montagnes qui nous semblent parfois impossibles. We have great impact when everyone is on the same page and is committed to taking this good action. Together, we can build back better. We can build back better. Ensemble, nous pouvons qu'on se reconstruire en le mieux. Together, we can build back better. Together, we can build back better. What a great way to kick off day two. Young people have been active architects of the 2030 Agenda and its development and continue to engage in frameworks, processes that support the implementation, follow up and review. The active engagement of youth and sustainable development efforts is central to achieving sustainable, inclusive and sustainable and stable societies. With just 10 years left to go, an ambitious global effort is required to deliver the 2030 promise. The decade of action calls for accelerating sustainable solutions to all the world's biggest challenges, ranging from poverty, gender, health, to climate change, and closing the financing gap. This morning, we will hear from youth from coast to coast to coast who will share their stories, their challenges, and commitment to the Agenda 2030. My name is Leveza Khan, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this morning's panel, Our Future, Our Time. I'm joined by Sharif Gorban, Maxime Laquette, Lindsay Basikal and Danielle Hartung. The global goals are our best hope for the people, for planet, for prosperity, and for, for peace and for partnership. At this time, I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Sharif Gubran. I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia's Individualized Program, where I'm conducting interdisciplinary research on the intersection between green building practices and sustainable development. I'm specifically using the SDGs as a framework for understanding and analyzing how buildings can contribute more meaningfully uh, for our quest to sustainable development. Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Maxime Lacat. I'm the founder and chair of the Canadian Business Youth Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, this youth council was basically formed to unite uh, Canadian undergraduate student organizations across Canada's business schools to really unite the movement uh, in order to grow it, uh, but also share best practices and, and disseminate essential knowledge on this topic. And finally, our mission uh, as the Youth Council is to represent uh, the youth of business by advocating as a whole so their voice can be that much louder when we're asking our universities, our governments, and our businesses to do more about sustainable business. My name is Lindsay Boskel and I am the Communications Director at Indigenous Climate Action. I'm based here in unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory uh, and I'm a Chickasaw, Irish and Polish and very happy to be here today. Yakuke. 
Hi everyone, it's great to be with you here today. Um, my name is Danielle Hartung and I work as the Senior Projects Communications Specialist for Samaritans First Canada, which uh, is an international disaster response and international development organization. Um, it's operating in over 30 countries worldwide and our Canadian office is based here in Calgary, where I live and work. Um, my background is in government and public policy. And now these last few years as I've transitioned into the humanitarian sector, I've um, had the opportunity and the privilege to get a front row seat to some um, of the incredible work and collaboration that is going on um, to achieve the sustainable development goals. So really looking forward to this conversation today. Great, thank you. Um, it's really exciting to have such a broad range of uh, backgrounds that you all represent and I'm excited for the conversation that we're about to dive into. So I'd like to start off with um, each one of you have spoken to some of the work that you're doing, but how are the SDGs being used in your field of work, ranging from business, activism, research, and administration? I'll let Sharif take the, take the floor. Okay. Um, so thank you. Um, I think um, based on my work uh, with, with the agenda and with the SDGs, I can um, identify three main approaches on how the the agenda is being used in research. We're still seeing a lot of uh, studies that are trying to investigate the agenda itself, how the goals interact, the, inter the trade-offs, the synergies between them. Uh, so for example, uh, maybe working on uh, SDG uh, 6 related to water can help um, tackle some issues around health and so on. But at the same time, if we focus on economic development, we might be putting other goals at risk related to climate action or, or so on. And we're seeing that kind of research on, on on, um, on two levels. There's uh, the global uh, view or the broad uh, uh, view of the agenda, but there's also um, uh, research that's focused on uh, like specific geographies, how these interactions happen in specific countries or regions, as well as within specific sectors. So like how does energy interact with the other goals and so on. Um, another line of research is looking at the contribution of different technologies and advancements into um, in, in achieving the SDGs and um, um, also highlighting how, what, what needs to change in our current practices in order to better attain. And um, uh, a lot of these studies are usually uh, evidence-based or, 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 or experiential or, or uh, case-based. Um, finally, a last line of research, which I think is a bit problematic, is a lot of the studies that are trying to show the intersections between how we currently do things and the possibility of contribution um, with, with a kind of uh, uh, a line of thinking of we're already doing great or if we, we know like uh, we follow a specific standard or a specific guideline that's already in place, we're going to be attaining uh, the, the, the SDGs, which might be true, but also in a lot of cases, these studies are very generic and um, not very evidence-based. And it's not really asking people to, to engage with the agenda and to learn about the agenda. In my field, in buildings, for example, a lot of building professionals don't know that the agenda is out there. So uh, the, this possibility of contributing to something that we don't know might be a bit, a bit problematic over the long run. Maxime, feel free to jump in. Great, uh, thanks. Um, so, so I guess how it is integrated was in my field, um, which is more like business, right? I think if we want to prepare the next generation uh, of leaders and mainstream sustainable uh, practices across sectors and industries, we really need to go to the root cause of the problem, which is education, right? And, and you know, one of the SDG goals is quality education. And I think everyone, you know, when to think about quality education, to think about um, ensuring that people all around the world, even in developing countries, get access to quality education. I would go much further than that and say that actually quality education is not only ensuring that there's a, a good public school system and that universities are, are well paid and like uh, like they're funded and that students can access those universities it's not only that it for me quality education is also ensuring that the education that that we're provided with um allows us to get prepared for the future and so that means you know getting that education about sustainability uh, the the thing is that if we want to change education which is still far from where we should be in terms of teaching sustainability we need to include youth um, in you know this change by truly sharing power with youth 
Um, and, you know, often youth is like being tokenized by, you know, institutions where being consulted about how to do something. But, you know, institutions don't really like to share power with, with youth oftentimes. And so I think, you know, to change education, we need to truly share power um, um, when, uh, when it's needed. And, you know, as uh, Beth Eden, who is the national leader for SDSN Youth Canada, uh, said in another panel, uh, youth needs to be incorporated into the decision-making process uh, and plans in governments, businesses, but also universities to ensure that the SDGs are going to be accounted for. And so the 2030 agenda is about, you know, intergenerational equity, valuing the present and the future generations. And to do so, youth must be at the table to achieve that goal. Um, yeah, well, in working in the humanitarian field, I think the SDGs are incredibly relevant and are really embedded into the fabric of the work that we're doing in the sector. Um, so the organization um, that I'm a part of and, and others in this field are um, obviously actively pursuing work that contributes to numerous targets that are set out in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, sustainable jobs and poverty, access to quality education, which Maxime just mentioned, gender equality, clean accessible water. Um, and really, I think that there is a blueprint that the SDGs um, have created for us, which is um, really a, blue, a blueprint for the international development project's future. Um, I think they also just provide a language with which to enable strategy and learning and collaboration. Um, and these things are incredibly important when we're talking about complex issues like the ones that are outlined here, like systemic poverty or food insecurity. Um, and I, I think that at the end of the day, um, they really help to foster collaboration and partnership, which really relates to the fact that when we speak to the SDGs in this field, it's incredibly important to recognize that the problems that each of these goals are addressing um, are not independent of one another. So when we're looking at solutions, we have to be able to address that and look at the interconnected nature of them. So solutions that are comprehensive and holistic I know are, are, um, are what the field is looking at, at moving towards. You know, to give an example, we know that every year of additional primary education, and again, kind of going off of, of what Maxine has mentioned in terms of quality education, but every year of additional primary education for young girls increases um, their possibility of earning wages by 10 to 20%. It encourages them, them to have fewer children and let, be less vulnerable to violence. So access to quality education is deeply connected to gender equality. And of course, access to education has a lot of issues and connections to access to sustainable and safe water sources. So you see how all of these different pieces play out together and are connected. So the SDGs, I think, enable these type of conversations to just create strategy and implement these kind of holistic and multi-sectoral approaches. Uh, I think that for my work in activism, I would say that a lot of activists, to be quite honest, don't really keep the SDGs in mind. It's not something that's really accessible for a lot of communities. Um, I think that maybe in certain fields, it makes sense when we're talking about uh, state policies and whatnot, it makes sense. But I think for a lot of people who are doing work on the ground, um, it's just not something that's really kept in the back of our minds. Uh, I would say that there is activism happening around every single one of the SDGs, however, whether or not people know that or not. Um, just in terms of even my work around Indigenous rights and sovereignty and climate justice, you know, we're integrating a lot of the SDGs into the work we do. So when you're thinking of many Indigenous communities across so-called Canada, there is lack of access to clean water, lack of quality education, lack of food sovereignty, lack of all of these things, basically lack of in infrastructure, health, and so social services. So really, the SDGs are failing in just about every Indigenous community in so-called Canada. Uh, so really, when we're doing our work around activism, it really is more of an intersectional recognition of the different aspects of identity and how all of those things come together so there's less of kind of the siloed work happening and there's much more of the we can't do x unless we have y and all of these things are connected so how can we get a quality education if we don't have clean water <laughs> and we don't have uh access to food and access to health and all of these other things so i think for a lot of activists that our work is not necessarily focusing on just one aspect of the SDGs per se, but focusing on multiple of them, whether or not we even know that we're doing it. Thank you for sharing some insight into your worlds. Um, there's a lot of intersections between some of the points you've all talked about. 
but I'm, I'm starting to hear a little bit about the challenges and I'd like to shift the conversation um, and use some of the words that you've given as a foundation to talk about what are the challenges in reaching Agenda 2030 in your work, in your field, um, in, in the activism work that you're engaging in. And I'll start with Lindsay. One of the better questions, at least for activists, is what challenges are we not facing? <laughs> Uh, just because literally it's like everything possible is like coming at us all the time. Um, so I think that one of the things that is really difficult is just that many activists don't have their essential needs met at the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, a lot of activists are doing this work on top of their everyday jobs or schooling or whatnot, um, parenting, all of these other things. So many activists are doing work without having access to uh, essential services, essential needs and whatnot. Um, oftentimes this can lead to things like burnout, a lot of people taking on a lot of not only work, but it, it's also a lot of mental and emotional labor a lot of times. So thinking in terms of doing indigenous rights work, uh, maybe going into spaces with people involved in government maybe, or people that don't have an understanding of indigenous rights and sovereignty, that don't respect indigenous rights and sovereignty, uh, it can lead to a whole lot of mental and emotional labor on our part, uh, which can also have a huge negative effect on mental health, especially when you're doing this work all the time and there's just never not a need. There's very little time to really take a break or anything like this. Even thinking of the, the COVID pandemic, um, you know, we're doing this work on an everyday basis and then COVID added this whole other layer to work and having to really shift and refocus things um, as to how to keep moving forward with the work that we're doing on top of making sure that our community members have access to things like, uh, you know, health services and protective equipment during the pandemic. So it's hard to really separate it, like the activist life outside of the rest of our lives. You know, it really is very intersectional. Um, and I would say just kind of two other things that come to top of mind as well is kind of the inaccessibility as well of funding. Um, that's one thing that can be really hard for a lot of communities, a lot of small organizations, um, a lot of individuals just doing work is being able to access funds because a lot of activist communities aren't these big organizations. They don't have capacity for things like doing a bunch of grant writing and fundraising. So access to funds is a huge barrier for a lot of people to be able to continue to do activism, especially activism that's on the ground, on the front lines. Um, and so with all of these different things, it leads to a lot of limited capacity, which means that folks are often forced to kind of choose what are the top priorities. So even though recognizing the intersectional nature of identity, folks are still kind of forced to say like, what is our top priority right now? You know, are we going to fight for clean water? Are we going to fight for food sovereignty? Because we can't do all the things at once. We only have so much capacity. So it does really kind of create this situation in which you really can't win, to, win at the end of the day. So really are kind of forced to you know choose what ends up being our priorities so really i think for for folks in the activist community the better question really is what challenges aren't we facing because there's just it's so many insurmountable challenges it seems at times um right so one of the challenges for for, for michael which is like more business shifting education uh in the business world about about sustainability um one challenge is 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 definitely um thinking about whether we're gonna be transformational enough right and, and and thinking if all this is is all the necessary change and if it's ambitious enough and you know if you look at everything that has been going on in the past two years and you don't need to be a sustainability expert or even someone interested in sustainability to recognize that sustainability first of all is crucial and second of all, it has a lot of opportunities, right? If you look at what happened over the news over the past two years, you know, not only Greta Thunberg, but the fires in Australia and the Amazon, uh, then you have the renewable prices that are just going down and down. They've actually at one point went under oil prices. Like there are lots of opportunities and there are uh, lots of also uh, recognition of like how crucial it is. So we need to be more transformational um, in terms of our ambitions than just saying, okay, sustainability is important and it has opportunities. We really need to ask ourselves the hard questions. And so two of the questions that in my opinion, summarize well this challenge. So two questions that I think actually anybody in the field of sustainability or in the field of sustainable business should ask themselves are, first of all, 
how can we achieve the sustainable development goals, so the SDGs, while staying within planetary boundaries? So maybe for some of you, you're not familiar with the planetary boundaries framework. I strongly recommend all of you to, to check out uh, the, the planetary boundaries framework. It kind of po poses the limits of what our planet can take in, right? Uh, and we've actually reached some of the limits already. Uh, so I want to say, you know, in the conversation about SDGs, it's great to talk about SDGs, right? But the recent research shows that we could go down a very dangerous path if we simply talk about SDGs without considering the planetary boundaries. Um, and, and why that? Because we could like make some progress about SDGs and try to tackle more and more SDGs without respecting the planetary boundaries. And so that would result in, you know, making a bit of progress on SDGs. But at the very end, we would worsen the situation because we're not respecting the planetary boundaries. So, and, and right now, to be honest, most of the projections show that SDGs right now, like our work towards SDGs is not at all taking into consideration the planetary boundaries framework. And I think that's very dangerous. So the first question is really asking ourselves, are we talking about SDGs the right way? And are we you know, putting this in the right framework in terms of planetary boundaries? Uh, so that's the first really important question that anyone should ask themselves. The second one to really make sure that we're transformational enough is asking ourselves whether our current goals and ambitions are transformational enough. And so one of our goals is carbon neutrality, right? And, and zero waste, carbon neutrality, zero waste. The government has recently made lots of announcements regarding those two things. And although a lot of people see those two goals as extraordinary, I would actually argue that they're not gonna save us because they're not transformational enough. They're necessary steps, so we need to achieve carbon neutrality and go more towards a zero waste uh, society, um, but I, I don't think they're enough. Why that? A very easy way you know, to realize that is by looking at the earth overshoot day. The Earth Overshoot Day is the date by which we have consumed so much resources that the planet cannot, you know, regenerate. So it's really this point in the year. Um, and, and so this overshoot day in 1970, in 1970, that Earth Overshoot Day was the 29th of December. So at the very end of the year. Today is the 29th of July. That's almost half a year less than in 1970. So basically by not, like the 29th of July each year, we have consumed like the maximum amount of resources that the planet can regenerate. And, and that's very dangerous. And the thing is achieving carbon neutrality and zero waste is going to allow us to stabilize that overshoot day, right? It's gonna be able to stabilize it and stopping to decrease and decrease every, every year. But you know, we have killed our planet and also our society so much. We have exploited our ecosystems and our society so much that we don't need to stabilize. We need to push back that date. We need to push it back. And what does that mean? We need to regenerate. We need to regenerate our ecosystems. We need to regenerate our planet and we need to regenerate our society, which we have been exploiting. And now we're at the brink of like literally like you know, like social unrest because the, of the level of inequality. So we need to regenerate both the ecosystems and the society. So in a very quick way, in my opinion, we need to think more in a regenerative way, more than simply a circular way. So going from circular economy business model, they're still like very valuable and they're like, it's, it's a step, but we also need to think about the step that is gonna be after which is regenerating the ecosystem and society. And so if we want to, you know, help uh, save, but also help enough people and ecosystems from the crisis that are going to come both at the social and environmental level, we need to be more ambitious. So that's, that's for me. I'll jump in here. Thanks, Maxime. Um, yeah, there's so much that could be said here and really little time to dig into it. But um, I do think from, uh, again, from a development organization perspective, we would be remiss not to mention just the current challenges that are being faced around the globe because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's kind of the current reality that we're living in and of course is going to affect um, the next weeks and, and months down the road um, in the international development world. So COVID-19 has certain, certainly presented incredible health challenges that have been greater and further reaching than I think many of us would have thought or, 
or predicted months ago. Um, but the secondary impacts that have come about from um, some of the harm reduction strategies that have put in place to stop the spread of COVID-19 um, are incredibly extensive. And I think it's these impacts from COVID, but possibly even more so from uh, the containment efforts that have, have gone on to be able to um, slow the spread. But I think it's actually some of those consequences from those efforts that will present the most challenges currently, um, but also into the foreseeable future and be a main challenge in achieving the 2030 agenda. Um, you know, in the past months, as countries have tried to slow the spread, you know, we're seeing this in a lot of countries where our organization is working. Um, many places have instituted government, government mandated shutdowns, borders have been closed, movement has been restricted, and it's in these types of contexts where there's um, medical capacity that is limited, you know, in, in, in slum areas, social distancing measures, hand washing measures are, are essentially impossible. Many communities don't have access to accurate information about how to keep themselves and their families safe and may even be exposed to incredibly harmful misinformation regarding health practices that may lead them um, to be susceptible to this virus. So in addition to just these immediate um, aid needs, as I've mentioned, um, I think these aggressive containment measures and the economic shutdowns that have occurred because of it um, have really magnified, magnified um, pre-existing vulnerabilities for people in these countries. So um, food and medicine shortages because of a closed border in places where a vast majority of the population are day laborers living hand to mouth, people um, are really uh, struggling because of these extended lockdowns. We've seen human trafficking intensified because of economic de depression, because of panic. Um, so there's more opportunities for brokers to prey upon increased vulnerabilities of people. And of course, um, we've also just seen a lot of protection and uh, gender-based violence issues. We've seen a steep increase in violence against women since this outbreak began. Um, so in many ways, I think COVID-19 um, and all of the pieces we've had to put in place to try and prevent that spread has unfortunately magnified these pre-existing vulnerabilities. And the international community is responding, but I certainly think that the ramifications of the secondary impacts of this pandemic are something that we're gonna to have to grapple with and um, will be likely one of the greatest challenges over the next years in achieving uh, the 2030 agenda. Uh, so, um, yeah, so in, in my line of work or in, in research, um, I think there's, um, uh, there's a few challenges that, that, uh, that, that I see. Um, I think one of the main ones is kind of this uh, shift of um, focus that uh, Maxine and Danielle both uh, uh, mentioned, this idea of moving from um, incremental change to transformational change and what type of work and research uh, that needs to happen to do that. Um, so I think the biggest challenge, as I highlighted in, in the answer for my first question, or one of the first challenges is kind of this uh, sustainable development washing, a type of greenwashing where we're labeling all these incremental improvements as transformational when they're not. Uh, so that's one thing, and that needs to shift in the research. Um, the second, uh, I think, is is what I what we can call externalization. So, uh, still today, a lot of you talk to a lot of researchers, and they feel that this uh, this topic of sustainability or sustainable development is this niche that's separate that has its own uh, people working on that's maybe more political, more more global. Um, and the first, and they always ask like what does the SDGs or sustainable development have to do with my work or my topic, even if they're working on something like uh, solar energy or well-being or automation, but they, they feel like it's a different niche that it, it's not really their field to work in. And I think here we really need to work on trying to foster this um, 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 kind of uh, culture of how can we relate, how can we make our work relate and how, how to think of how to make it fit as opposed to how does it not relate. It's very easy to 
make it not relate. It's, it's kind of a bigger challenge to try to, uh, to make it fit within the framework and to, and to think of its broader implications. Um, the last challenge, which I can maybe highlight a bit, is what, I, what, what we can think of as generalization. And in this generalization, we're generalizing both benefits overlaps. So this is kind of the opposite of the externalization, where you, you, you see some researchers saying, you know, like, I'm working on this topic, and this is going to help us attain all the 17 goals. Well, you know, like we need to be a little bit more critical than that uh, to, to think of which challenges we're really tackling and, and how we're doing that. But also there is generalization in terms of criticism. And this is also uh, something that I think we need to, to remedy or to work on. So we, you know, like you, a lot of researchers, a lot of people are saying, you know, like the, the framework is, is too generic, it's too uh, global, it's not, uh, uh, it's missing that portion or this portion. And yes, for sure, the, the framework is not perfect. Uh, it's, it's not meant to be perfect, but it's, it's just a framework for us to think, to think through. Criticism and, and, and uh, constructive criticism in that sense is positive, but it shouldn't, uh, just because it's missing one portion doesn't mean that we should discredit the whole uh, of the agenda or so. So, um, uh, and of course, on the, on the side of the over, uh, like, um, exaggerating or generalizing these overlaps, we can also, uh, like, foster this understanding of the complexity of these issues and their interrelation um, in order to avoid oversimplifying them in, in that sense. So, uh, that, that would be maybe the, the three or uh, challenges that I see. Great. Thank you for, um, for providing some insight. When it comes to challenges, it's, it's very evident that there's an abundance of them. Um, many of them are cross-cutting across the work that you four are doing, um, ranging from access to resources that make it very difficult to work, particularly on the ground, um, working within our boundaries and, and respecting some of those boundaries that are set um, and ensuring that we're working within those means. Um, responding to the impacts of COVID-19, I think that has been um, very evident um, for the development sector, but also across all industries and sectors, um, understanding what it means to work within this uh, pandemic, but what is next and, and what are the impacts of, of the of the reality that we're living in. Um, and then a point that Sharif and, and Maxine made around uh, the need to be more transformational. Um, while this agenda lays out a blueprint and uh, provides a vision for the future, uh, we need to be ambitious in the way that we approach it and the way that we embed it in the work that we're doing. So I thank you for sharing your challenges. Um, and I hope that we're able to work together and, and use um, use the resources that we have and, and also learn from one another uh, to overcome these challenges moving forward. So I'd just like to, to shift a little and, um, you know, we've talked about the, the worlds that you're coming from and how the SDGs are embedded within them, the challenges um, that you're faced with and the work that you're doing, uh, the very important work that you're doing in ensuring that we, we do achieve Agenda 2030. Um, as young people working on the ground in, in very varying backgrounds and, uh, and realities, what's one way that you believe youth can work towards a better future in 2030? And I'll start with you, Lindsay. I have more than one way. I have like multiple ways, I suppose. Um, I think there, there are a couple of main things. Um, also just this, this kind of also addresses a question that was asked in the chat about around whether or not um, the most impacted communities in so-called Canada will be able to meet the SDGs. And short answer is, I don't think so. No, I don't believe so. Not at the current rate. Um, just thinking of indigenous communities in general, lack of drinking water. There are boil water advisories across the country. Um, Grassy Narrows is still uh, facing mercury poisoning. There are issues of sovereignty and land rights across the country as well. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is that youth need to act as co-conspirators with one another. Um, beyond allyship, the word ally is used a lot, um, but I prefer the word co-conspirator uh, and actively dismantling systems of oppression and capitalism as well. Um, I think if we want to meet the SDGs, there's no possible way that we can meet SDGs while living under capitalist and colonialist governments. Um, I, 
don't believe that it's possible to be quite frank. Capitalism is a system that's built upon privilege and power. And I don't think that there is any possible way that we can create societies that are in any sort of way just while living under those systems. Um, for youth that have privilege um, in terms of things like white privilege and whatnot, um, one thing that is talked about a lot in the activist community is any actions that are arrestable. Um, we tend to try and see if co-conspirators that are white will be the ones that put themselves forward for something like arrest, um, recognizing that folks that are white tend to face less uh, obstacles when it comes to police and there tends to be less violence directed at them. Um, so I think that a lot of ways that youth can be involved in activism is thinking more along how they can use their, not only their privileges, but also just the skills that they have. Um, I think within activism, there's oftentimes a lot of pressure of going to like the, the 100 level. Uh, like I have to go out and I have to, you know, get arrested and all these different things and do protests and interruptions. But I think a lot of it is also recognizing that we all have different skills. Um, so how can we use those skills for, for the movement, I suppose. Um, and finally, just being willing to learn and grow. Um, a lot of conversations that happen within activist communities can be very difficult. Um, we're all people, we come into communities, whether we recognize it or not, that we might have biases that we're unaware of, or we might have, be lacking education in certain areas, we might be ignorant about certain things. So it's also about being willing to learn and grow, um, just constantly throughout the course of the movement and being willing to have conversations with people, being willing to call people in versus calling people out, um, because call out call call-out culture can be really detrimental to a lot of activist movements. So it's being willing to even have conflict internally and being willing to work through that and to really, you know, build up stronger movements. Maxim, I'll have you go next. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you, to, thank you, Lindsay, for, for, these, uh, for these insights. Um, I, I'll go uh, answering that question, I, I just wanted to uh, reflect very quickly on what you just said. And and I just, like, I, I agreed on everything. There's just one thing where I kind of disagree, and I think we can maybe find a common point. It's just like a reflection, right? And, and maybe a discussion for then, like, the attendees to think about uh, in the future. But you said uh, we cannot um, have a prosperous and, and, and just a better, like, society that we should all aiming at through a capitalist system. In my opinion, capitalism doesn't mean anything because you like the version of capitalism that you have in Sweden versus the one you have in Canada versus the one in America or France are very, very different. I think our current form of capitalism is absolutely a disaster and just cannot work. What I would recommend everyone very briefly to check out is some, a link I will put in the description, which is called the Regenerative Capitalism uh, Framework. It's actually partly inspired from um, indigenous values and like indigenous knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and these principles and this framework, which is very practical and like very, like very much ingrained in reality, proposes a new form of capitalism, which is, in my opinion, the most transformational framework that I've ever read. And it is probably very much in line with the type of society you want to achieve, Lindsay, and that we will all want to achieve. And it is called, as it is still called capitalism, uh, but it's very transformational and, 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 you know, even radical sometimes. So I'll put that in the comments so everyone can maybe read it and, and engage with it because that framework really allows people to understand how much we need to learn from indigenous values and indigenous communities, um, while also seeing how we can apply that to the broader economy as well. And I think this framework really allows to, to bridge that gap uh, and make it very concrete. So I'll post that right after answering this question. But I really love everything else you said, and I think we're kind of saying the same thing. Um, I'm just offering this framework that not that many people know uh, that kind of goes in line with what you're saying. Um, so now about what I think youth can do about achieving the SDGs. I think that youth, especially in business, because that's the field where I work in, uh, youth in business uh, needs to advocate for a much more ambitious plan uh, on sustainability than most business schools are actually considering to teach right now. We need to be much more ambitious in terms of the plan that we're asking for. And uh, one very concrete thing that you can do 
um, is uh, read the guide that I'm also going to post in the comment section to everyone. Uh, so this guide is uh, basically 20 statements on the state of sustainable business in Canada. Uh, this is basically the resource I wanted to share with, with everyone here. And it's basically, in my opinion, one of the best frameworks uh, about the necessary capitalist reformation. It talks about planetary boundaries. It talks about regenerative capitalism. It talks about sharing power with youth. It really talks about a lot of points that the different panelists brought up today. And this like framework, this guide, if youth were to follow it and ask businesses, governments, but also universities to follow it, uh, I think the, the, the change would be much more ambitious than, than where we are heading uh, right now. It's, um, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing your your thoughts. I think um, um, what, what one maybe a key theme that uh, that's uh, very important here with the, what like what the youth can offer or how the youth can can help is really rethinking the existing systems, whatever those are. So whether it's the economic or financial system, whether it's the uh, system where we do research within, um, I think these are all. Uh, things that have to be rethought uh, in order to reflect kind of this interlinked and uh, complex uh, challenges that are highlighted in the uh, 2030 agenda. So, um, uh, so one thing I'd say is, is that, uh, you know, like the, the, the youth as opposed to the current uh, um, or, or, um, or the, the traditional uh, way of, of, uh, of doing things are not necessarily interested in pre protecting the siloed approach uh, where there is separation between business, uh, you know, activism, research. I, I think there is a view or a direction where we're more and more seeing that these are really interlinked and that they have to be interlinked in order to push us forward to solve these complex issues. And I think this is where um, the biggest contribution can happen on the research uh, uh, front, you know, like uh, it, it, um, we need uh, for, research, for, for transformational work to happen. We need people on the ground, we need people writing about it, we need people uh, in the administration to allow it to happen, to support it, but we, uh, we also uh, need businesses to, uh, to find ways uh, that, uh, to, to, uh, to integrate uh, these, these actions and to support it. So I think the, the, uh, uh, all this uh, requires a type of dyna dynamic innovators and actors that is really exemplified in, in the youth. And uh, um, in terms of resources that I'm, that I'm sharing, I shared a few resources that directly relate to, uh, to, to my own field in, uh, in uh, design and, and buildings. Um, we're really, um, we're trying to um, think of how um, the work can contribute to the SDGs and what type of innovative or dynamic actions uh, from, from different generations actually are, are can, can help tackle the different issues in, in something uh, such as design and urban and built spaces. Thank you. I know we're short on time here, so I'll just be brief, but um, you know, I would really summarize um, how, how youth can be involved um, with, with being informed and being involved. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about, we've, we've all had some different viewpoints we've shared here, and I would just um, challenge young leaders to um, look at different perspectives, look at different sources, um, look at sociological viewpoints, look at economic viewpoints, look at different political perspectives. And I would just really encourage all of us to become critical thinkers and savvy consumers in um, the digital age where we have this vast wealth of information um, I think that one of the challenges young leaders will face is being in an echo chamber where they're hearing the same opinions um, time and time again. But I really think we, we need to open ourselves up to the diversity of thinkers, the diversity of perspectives, and um, be able to use that to then build a logical framework for how we want to address some of these big issues in the world. So I would just encourage um, young leaders to, um, to do that, to challenge yourselves in looking at some of these different perspectives. Um, my research background colors this a bit, but Canada has some incredible think tanks that are doing some wonderful, um, uh, really solid research-based work, providing world-class information. So look to places that are providing solid data and then be able to use that to build a logical framework for your involvement in, in addressing these concerns and um, how you'll then get involved with these things. 
Thank you to our panelists for, for joining us today and for providing insight into how the SDGs are embedded into their work, the important role that youth play in this conversation and how the SDGs should not be forgotten. Um, together, across borders or across sectors and generations, we can work towards Agenda 2030. And I thank you for your time and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Have, uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, that was uh, that was really really insightful. Thanks to uh, the uh, to, thanks to Lavisa uh, for facilitating this. Uh, Maxime, um, Lindsay, uh, Sheriff, and the rest. Uh, just, that was really awesome. I think I want to say that I echo a lot of the sentiment that uh, Lindsay, uh, Sheriff, and uh, Daniel shared on uh, how to be aware of your how to be aware, how to be informed of your surrounding. It's really important to look at the systems that are already in place. And I think with everything that's happening right now uh, with COVID, we've noticed how inequalities and uh, can shift really fast because of some of the system that we have in place. It's important to look at the system, see how we can either better rebuild them, but also have to uh, go back from the ground up. So yeah, that was really, really exciting. And so we have a lot of, uh, we're about to begin the next block of programming. There's a lot of, uh, lot of things coming up. Uh, we have six different rooms that you can check. Uh, the conference schedule for the corresponding Zoom link uh, is at together on some uh, If you, uh, you have a chance to regroup in chat, uh, and chat about uh, the session you were in during the Coffee Connections at 12.45 and all you can stay in these sessions for the full uh, after the 45 minutes to you know ask questions uh, keep talking with the speakers uh, also uh, an option at 12.45 is Solution Spotlight highlighting uh, UNESCO by biosphere reserves uh i'll check in with you all again at 1 p.m eastern daylight time uh when you meet uh, again with the uh with jacob uh with jake uh, berkowitz sorry with jake teams and his amazing team of reporter and yeah so thanks a lot to everyone thanks a lot to the uh, youth panelists that was really insightful those were really good conversation and have a good rest of the day and yeah thank you all and see you soon